This video goes over SAT questions of the day for week three. Number one is an absolute value problem, but it breaks some of the rules that we traditionally follow. In a typical problem, we would want to isolate the absolute value brackets by moving everything over to the other side. And once we have a situation like this, we branch out and we have a positive and a negative side, which means we have two answers. We have an answer that causes x plus 2 to equal positive 4, and that one's going to be 2. And we also have an answer that causes x plus 2 to be a negative 4, and that one's going to be negative 6. And in both cases, if we add 2, we'll get a value that if we plug into our original bracket is going to come out as a positive 4, because absolute value is the distance from 0. The problem here is that when we subtract 1 from both sides, we end up with the absolute value of n minus 1 is equal to a negative 1 which breaks the definition of absolute value because absolute value is distance from zero. Distance cannot be negative. There is no such value. Number two uses this graph about the total cost of renting a boat by the hour. And a couple things to note, our x-axis has the variable h and our y-axis has the variable c. Also notice the scale, we count over four squares for every hour, so each actual little unit is like 15 minutes, but the y-axis, though it counts by twos, every square is one dollar. So those are important things to note. Two asks you, what is the c-intercept, or what does the c-intercept represent in the graph? So first of all, the c-intercept is where this line crosses the c-axis, which we see here, and that's exactly at five. So given this scenario, if you have rented a boat for zero hours, it will have costed you five dollars. That's that flat fee that you have to pay regardless of how long you rent the boat. We'll go ahead and circle A. Number three, referring back to that same graph, asks about the relationship between H and C. So we want to figure out what the cost is based upon how many hours we have rented the boat for. We know it's going to be plus five from number two. So that rules out, rules out A and D right off the bat. After all, in the same way that in a typical equation, y equals mx plus b, b is the y-intercept, or where this line crosses the y-axis, in c equals 3h plus 5, for example, that 5 is the c-intercept, or where the line crosses the c-axis, which we just figured out is here at 5. So the only thing left to decide is my slope. Is it 3 fourths? or three. This is where the weird scale comes into play, because as we increase by one hour, we are going up by one, two, three dollars. As we increase by one hour, we're going up by one, two, three dollars. So it's three dollars per hour. That's why C is the best choice. We have our slope of three and our intercept of five. Number four is a polynomial question about when you factor quadratics and you account for the zeros. It doesn't quite look like it, though. Typically, these problems look more like this. Let's say we have a quadratic, x squared plus 5x plus 6, and we might factor that. And if we do so, we would end up with x plus 2 times x plus 3. So a problem might give you that if you plug in some number for x, you get different results for y. For example, if this was a table of values over here, they might ask you which one of these is a factor. And the answer would be, since y is 0 when x is negative 2, that x plus 2 is a factor. And you could figure that out based on the 0. The difference with this problem, though, is when we plug in a 3 for the input, our output is not a 0, but it's just a negative 2. All the variables are gone. Factors of a polynomial means that this ax squared plus bx plus c is going to be written in factored form. So if we try to use x minus 5 or x minus 2 as factors, and we plug in 3, our input, are those going to be canceled out? 3 minus 5, is that 0? No. Or 3 minus 2, is that 0? Or if I change to x plus 2, answer choice C, is that going to cancel out and give me 0? No. None of those. But it turns out if I was to plug in a 3 to answer choice D, one of the factors being x minus 3, that will cancel out. So the multiplication part this becomes 0 times, we don't know what the second one is, but it's going to cancel out. And then my remainder must be negative 2, because after all, that's my output instead of 0. So the answer choice was D. 
For number five, you have to know that the equation of a circle with the center h, k, and a radius r uses this formula. The only equations they give you regarding circles on the SAT are area and circumference. So this is just one that's handy to know because it makes a problem like this quite a bit easier. So I can plug in 0, comma, 4 as my center, which means I plug in 0 here and 4 there. Now to figure out my radius, I have my point zero 0,4 and I have an endpoint 4 thirds 5. So if I try to use the Pythagorean theorem here, which is on the cheat sheet for the SAT, the formula sheet, my distances are 4 thirds and 1. So to figure out this other side, I'm going to take 4 thirds squared plus 1 squared and set that equal to c squared. 4 thirds becomes 16 ninths. I can rewrite 1 as 9 over 9. And my hypotenuse squared is equal to 25 ninths. So following those steps, I actually can just plug that right in here for r squared, because this is already c squared. So r squared will be replaced with 25 ninths. So looking at my answer choices, I see that 5 thirds and 3 fifths is wrong. And x minus 0, this part goes away, and it's y minus 4, not plus 4. That's why a is the best choice. Number six is a systems of inequalities problem, and fortunately they labeled the quadrants for us. So we can graph each of these inequalities just like they were linear equations by looking at the slope and the intercept. So we'll start with the slope. Here, I'll do this one here in blue. And we start at one, and we're gonna go up to right one. And that's not perfect, but that's a pretty good estimation of that line. This one here, I'm gonna start with my intercept of negative one, and I'm going to go up one, right two. And the line will be something like this. So we're looking at a system. So for this first blue line, when is y bigger than this, greater than this? Well, that's anything up here above the line. And same thing for the other one, the red line, it's anything above this. The question asks, which quadrant contains no solutions? So quadrant one definitely has lots of solutions that would fit both inequalities way up here, and so does quadrant two and quadrant three. But if you look down here in quadrant four, there's only a couple solutions that fit the red line, and there's none that are above the blue line. So that's why quadrant four is the best answer. Number seven, Katerina is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. She noticed that type A trees produced 20% more pears than type B trees did. Based on her observation, if the type A trees produced 144 pairs, how many pairs did the type B trees produce? So type A trees produced more than B. So type A is 144, and that's supposed to be more than B, so we can logically just rule out D. And we're trying to figure out 144 pairs is 20% more than which of these numbers? So one kind of roundabout guess and check way would be to figure out what 20% of each of these numbers is. And it turns out those are the numbers, and if we were to add them to the original, which of these has a sum of 144? And you could find the answer, B, 120. Another way of thinking of this is that if type A trees produced 20% more than type B trees did, while well, we're looking at 100% of type B trees plus another 20%. So that's 120 in total. And if we move our decimal place over twice, we end up with this equation. A is equal to 1.2 B. And that's how we convert percentages into decimals. We start off with the original 100% plus the 20% more. We move the decimal place over. So if we can plug in 144 for A, we just divide both sides by 1.2 and get the same answer, 120. Number eight is a radical problem. If you look at A, and how it's equal to 5 root 2. If we double both sides of this original equation, we end up with 2a is equal to 10 root 2. And they tell us over here that 2a is equal to something else. So it turns out these two statements are actually equal to each other. 10 root 2 is equal to root 2x. It's actually possible to stick this, one, this 10 back underneath the radical if you square it. And this becomes the square root of 2 times 100, 
equals root 2x. Because if you were simplifying a square root, and you had the square root of 200, you would look for the largest perfect square factor, and you would pull it out. And you would pull it out as a 10. But you can do the same thing in reverse. So this makes it pretty clear that x is going to be equal to 100. Because we have 2 times 100 here on the left, and 2 times x on the right. Number 9 is a mean or average problem. So that's a measure of central tendency. So I know the answer is probably going to be somewhere here in the middle. If I had to guess, somewhere around 6, just looking at this graph. It's a little bit skewed, but not so much. To actually calculate it, I could figure out each individual value, add them all together, and divide by how many. So for example, there are 2 apples with 3 seeds. There are 4 apples with 5 seeds. There are one, or there's one apple with six seeds, and two with seven seeds, and three with nine seeds. If I total those by adding them all together, I get 73 seeds. If I divide by how many, and there are 12 apples, as it says here, 73 divided by 12. 6.083 repeating, which is closest. The answer is six. 10 is one of the rare problems that a given formula can actually be used that the volume of a cylinder is equal to pi r squared times the height. And we can plug various things from this paragraph into this equation. They tell us the volume of the silo is 72 pi. So I'm going to replace v with 72 pi. We also can see the height here is 8. So I could rearrange things a little bit, and maybe I cancel out the pi from both of these. I can do that, just divide it out. And then I'm left with 72 is equal to 8r squared. And maybe I divide both sides by 8, and I get that 9 is equal to r squared. And we can pretty clearly figure out the radius here. If we take the square root of both sides, the radius is going to be 3. Remember that the radius is the distance from the middle of a circle to one side. But the diameter is double the radius. So that distance 3 across to the other side. The diameter is 6.